and welcome to another episode of Live and Loose here in the Edge Entertainment Australia studios. I am joined by a little bit of karate royalty at the moment. I'm joined by the director, one would say, Sensei Tom. How are you? I'm well, thanks, Roscoe, and thank you so much for hosting us this evening. It's a privilege to be here. Well, you're the first director I've actually had on the couch, so I'm actually super stoked. I can put that on my bucket list of interviewing a director. Yeah. Of, uh, Not that it's a casting couch. <laughs> that's it. Well, um, on a, and an absolutely cracking documentary that's going to be coming out to the general public on the 28th of November. Very, very excited to, to talk about that and to see it. Had a really good conversation with um, Sensei Mike about it, and uh, he spoke... Really high praises of you, and rightly so. Though you deserve the credit that 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 is coming your way. You've done something incredibly amazing by turning an idea into a documentary. Now, there's not too many people that can say that they've done that in their life. I'm pretty sure that was never on your bucket list to say. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> can you give me a bit of insight as to how Sensei Tom got to that point of becoming a director? What was uh, so, uh, actually? No, we'll wind it back a step. What was your experience in doing that in the first place? Because I know you worked in oil and gas. Can you talk a little bit about what you were doing in there and, and how that transferred into making this amazing documentary? Yeah, so absolutely, Roscoe. Um, yeah, the, uh, you know, it's not a childhood dream. This is something that, <laughs> that evolved organically. And, and I guess I'm as surprised as anybody to be sitting here discussing this. If you'd have asked yeah. me this two years ago, I would have said that's a, a ridiculous yeah. notion. Um, I, I have the privilege, I work for an organisation called Safer Together uh, in the oil and gas industry. And one of my jobs last year was coordinating information for COVID-19 response. Oh, okay, yeah. and, and as part of that, uh, I learned how to make six infomercials yep. on COVID Safe called Play Your Part. Now, the team at Safe Together, there's very talented script writers and media people, yep. and they helped me do a series of interviews with senior people in the resources industry yep. to make these six informa- infomercials. And th- they were very useful, very popular and, and successful. Uh, so I've learned a new skill there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, naively thought, well, why not make a documentary? You know, it couldn't be yeah. that much harder than making an infomercial. <laughs> I and, can do this. And, and um, you know, so confidence far exceeding ability. Yeah. Uh, and so so ha- had this idea. We were also streaming um, classes at the time. So, yeah. you know, Shobagan had the foresight, like some dojos, to start streaming um, classes when the lockdowns happened. Yeah. So we were getting, you know, familiar with using Facebook Stream, Zoom. Uh, and and the, the idea I had originally with my new interviewing skills, yeah. was was that we would get um, Sensei Kao on the couch like this with a live stream ah. and a Japanese interpreter, yeah. and, and I would interview, and the audience could ask questions of Sensei. Um, yeah. Now, because we were in lockdown, that wasn't possible. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we couldn't go into an old folks' home. Yeah, yeah. From residents yeah. couldn't be allowed out. And so that was a blessing because I had – a few more weeks to think about the idea and it developed slowly as, you know what, when we're out of lockdown, why don't we make a, a documentary? And the idea at the time was to interview Sensei, a few of the senior instructors, ah. and it would have been, you know, sort of a 10-minute long yeah, piece. Yeah. Would, yeah. Have been, would have been pretty cool, uh, yeah. get, get, get a bit of history. And, and what was really fortunate was uh, Dion and Mike partnered me with, me with an amazing... Uh, cinematographer John Marcel Rousselet, yep. uh very very skilled in in the art, uh, and as we did the interviews, he gave me very very good advice about getting ah. backing visuals. So we start we we more or less re- ended up reverse engineering this thing because yeah. not being a documentary maker, I didn't really understand that you should do your discovery first, design yeah. your script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and but but the fortunate thing was I knew a fair bit about the topic. Yep. and a fair bit about karate. So my shortcomings as a director were able to be made up for with knowledge in the, yeah, net, yeah. In the network. Had we done a new topic like genetics, we'd you know, <laughs> dead, no. dead in the water. <laughs> um, but what happened is it grew organically because as people knew we were doing this and we interviewed them, they started coming forward with amazing archival ah. footage and photos and newspaper cuttings going back 50 years. Wow. And so when we started getting... The, the incredible graphics, and we got some Super 8 footage from the 70s film that we converted to yeah, digital. that's cool. That came across so well. You know, Sensei, you know, in his prime, yeah. the way he moved was beautiful. So it, it became to a point where we'd finished and we thought, 
we were very close to it, John and I, and we thought, yeah. this is pretty amazing, but we need others to check it. So, we, yeah. you know, we showed uh, Sensei Steel on a mic, and we, we recommended we should get a composer. We think this is good enough to be in the cinema yeah. now that we've built this this thing. Um, and we had hundreds of hours of footage. We got it down to 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, um, got it, you know, Mason Velios, or, the original score, you know, it's only been played twice. Yeah. You know, so you yeah. want to hear that on yeah. the 28th. Uh, uh, and we decided to to put it into a cinema. So from original concept and how the idea germinated, and, and I had time in COVID to do yeah, this, yeah. Um, to what ultimately came. Um, the vision was not as big at the start as I guess yeah. what we what yeah. we ended up with Roscoe. So so the momentum essentially of, of like you say the, that germination of that of that seed of just cracking open and starting to grow to the full blown plant at the end. You know you probably wouldn't have thought of having the orchestral scores and and all the rest of it. You're thinking, well, hang on a second, I've I've, I've got wheels on this thing. I can call it a car, but we need the doors, we need everything else, and that grew with the amount of I suppose input of other people as well too. Uh, absolutely, look, people were so generous with their time and and their. Um, their archival records to to make this happen. Yeah. Uh, you, you know the the you, you'll see uh, everybody. In fact, we've got several generations of people. We've got you know some some young kids. That's we've cool. got senseis in their twenties, in their thirties, in yeah. their forties, in their fifties, in their sixties. We didn't find anyone in their seventies, and, and senseis in his eighties. So this this film, people wow. that are in it, spans yeah, you know four, gen- four generations yeah. of people. Uh, so so that was a really um, extraordinary pulling that together and seeing the different experiences they'd had. Uh, and then, you know, when, when Mason wrote the score, you know, I'd probably seen the film about ten times. Yeah. We'd spent many hours cutting, slicing, editing with John, who did a really skilled job, yeah. uh, you know, in the editing suite, and, and then making sure the visuals matched the storyline. Yeah. And then Mason wrote the score, and it, it it's beautiful, um, ethereal, haunting, Because that's all performed live, isn't it? Because Sensei Mike was saying something on lines that was – all done live. It, it was incredible. So it was a new experience for me, you know, after the editing suite, to go into a music studio. Wow. And, and, and Mason interviewed us about each scene. Yep. And he said, Tommy, what's happening there? And, he, you know, Mason's sort of like of Australia's answer to <laughs> yeah. Jack Black in School of Rock. Oh, yes, yes, Think yes, Mr. Yeah. Schneebly? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this guy, you know, I mean, you know, if you want to see him really rock out, you know, he's at the Mustang Bar on Saturday nights okay. doing, doing ACD covers, ACDC covers. <laughs> but um, he's a very skilled musician, and he would just change the pitch depending on what was happening and to evoke emotion. Well, it was extraordinary. I mean, yeah. certain scenes, you know, when Sensei's getting presented the awards by the Consul General, you know, he's, I'd say, you know, it's really important. So it became more formal or it changed from the yeah. guitar to the Japanese flute to the piano. Yeah. And so it was an iterative process of him learning what was happening on the screen and then matching really beautiful soundtrack. And, and, that, and that's what's really good about the, I suppose, the evocative and the emotion that it pulls out of the scene with that accompaniment of, of awesome music, whether it is, like you say, the Japanese flute or, or, a, or a piano piece. It just brings it that next level of life to an amazing story to have a really cool soundtrack is it just transverse. I'm very, very excited about seeing it because I've been told some really, really good things, but I think just having it all unfolded in front of you with with the scenes the history behind it the, the cultural exchange that is obviously the japanese piece that starts off you know when when sensei was in his 60s and his 70s leading all the way through to now i think it's going to be a journey that is going to be appreciated by so many people not just karate people um it's going to be people that like uh, whether it be martial arts or just that that leadership role or you know or just the the historical value of it as well is it is quite amazing. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point in that um, we've we've a few people have seen it that are not of a karate background, yeah. uh, and uh, people that are interested in history, uh, or, or in very mu- in many ways, this is a very Australian story. You know, an immigrant yeah. from another country yeah. comes to Australia in the seventies with a very uh, minimal grasp of English yeah. and makes not only a life here but an incredibly successful life oh, creates and, create, a legacy. and creates a legacy yeah. so so it's really I think you know people that are interested in you know multiculturalism in Australia yeah. um, people that are interested in leadership perseverance uh, you know struggling against you know difficult odds mm. um, you know you know having survived you know, the bombing of Osaka yeah. in World War Two. Just to then build a life in the in the Japanese Self Defence Force, you know, become uh, you know head martial arts instructor, self 
fence and structure yeah. for the for the forces and and also changing yeah. over as a massive change in cultures. I mean, the Japanese culture as uh, sort of to the Australian culture, if you will, is a huge leap. It's a massive adjustment for someone who is reasonably young that's had to leave that way of life to come over here and and quite selflessly create a legacy, whether he meant to do it or not. He has. It's never been a one of you know. Oh, this is what I'm going to do. This is just a byproduct of, of generally being a nice person and, and doing the right thing, which is something that needs to be celebrated and represented a bit more in society. Yeah, that, that was something that I found really fascinating was the number of schools and, you know, the, the hundreds if not thousands of students that have been through Shoba Khan. Yep. Uh, and also, you know, coming out in the 70s to, to start something like that and also, you know, a, a noodle bar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in, in the seventies <laughs> exactly. in in, uh, in in West Australia, and because um, that was heavily frowned upon, someone in Japan teaching Westerners a martial art that was like, yeah, and, and look, it, you, it was pretty dangerous in those days. Yeah. Like Sensei doesn't shrink from it. Um, there were a lot of injuries. Yeah, uh, and uh, you, you know we've managed to make it much safer while still having yeah. an excellent uh, a martial experience. Uh, but uh, yeah, that that's certainly something he he shares and reflects upon us, and you know he's very proud that now families can train together, yeah. and you know children can compete, which was yeah. which was not the case I- in those days. Um, it, that's a very actually good lead into my next question. Is there anything that you saw, sort of collecting that Super H footage and all that, and go, hang on a second, we actually do that in class, or we've trained that slightly modified, of course, because Sensei Mike's told me of a couple of horror stories of how they used to train up the hills at Lance and all the rest of it. Um, is there anything you looked yeah. at and gone, we do a very, very similar version uh, of that? So, so, so absolutely. You, you'll see uh, footage from the 70s, 80s and 90s, uh, and you know, it's not just interesting seeing the way Sensei Kao moved and taught, yeah. uh, but the, many of the drills are identical today oh, wow. uh, what the good news is i guess for the modern practitioner is um you know the sports science behind this as well yeah, yeah so uh it was very much um training very very hard very traditional in some cases um you know injuries occurred and and yep. uh, you know n- now we've got you know better equipment yeah, uh, yeah and a better knowledge of biomechanics and and recovery yeah. and and that so uh I, and also, I think, like you said catering yeah. to a more wider group it wasn't necessarily your and i hate to use the term atypical you know bloke 16 to 20 odd or whatever it's now it's now a benefit a benefit to children it's a benefit to mums you know aunties uncles you know the age at this point in time is no longer a barrier studying a martial art because it it's gone from running up those hills at Lancelin um, to to doing it to more techniques technique based as opposed to more power training and I suppose the application of martial arts in its true form has and don't get me wrong you can still go out and do your amateur fighting and all the rest of it but there is a almost a niche market for that as opposed to getting more out of it from a from a holistic point of view of martial arts yeah and, and I think that that accessibility um and and you know there's a really lovely scene when sensei talks about that it, that he's happy that he's created a peaceful place where families can train together that's, that's uh, and, and that, that's Really, yeah. uh, I think, because you'll see him reflecting back on his life yeah. uh, of, of things that have meant a lot to him, and that's one of the things that he's really happy about. Did you ever think when you started creating it was going to get this big? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, there, there was a point uh, probably about four months ago yeah. um, where John Rousselet and I sat and watched the, hot, the cut, uh, no music, and went, Wow, yeah, we're on a we, we think, yeah, and you have to be careful about your ego. And we, you've been very close to something. Yeah, yeah. We go. We think this is something really special, like goosebumps down yeah, your back yeah. for something you've watched dozens of times. Yeah. We spend hours with each little segment, uh, and go. We think we've got something really special. Uh, let's get you know, since I do on mic over for an evening, uh, yeah. and watch it. We're going to recommend some music. Cool, right? And, and then we got the music, and we're like, oh my word. We think this is good enough for a cinema. Make a digital cinema package. Let, wow. Let's do that. Uh, and then we had a very clear vision of if we can get Sensei, if he's well enough, and, and thankfully he was, yeah, yeah. plus everybody that we interviewed in the film, plus so many of his students over the yeah. years, yeah. plus everybody that worked on the film, we got all of them in for the premiere. That's cool. And, and it was really special. I mean, one of the, the highlights of, of my life was yeah. to have played a part creating that and then... For a standing ovation for Sensei, 
as, as we were going, you know, this yeah, is your yeah. officer. Thank you for everything you've given us. It was really amazing. And would it, it would have been really, really cool to see and, and fulfilling to see since I KO acknowledged that and go, and the fact that he never asked for it, it was just something that was given selflessly to, okay, we wanted to say thank you. And the best way of doing that is, is literally creating a, a, a memory, a journey, a uh, a story, if you will, that can be used for so many other things, not just karate. I mean, the applications are uh, amazing when it comes to leadership training, uh, even just the leadership group in karate in general, like to show that to up-and-coming um, juniors that want to be senseis or, you know, are studying to be black belts or anything like that. It's so much – and the fact that you've got it now, like – Having that Super 8, like Super 8's rare as hen's teeth, like, you know what I mean? It's like getting money out of a relative. You just don't have it. But now having a digital copy of it just makes it so much more – and also the footage that you haven't shown. Like that's the kind of little stuff you want to – the Star there's, Wars there's, alternative ending kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's a lot. So, yeah, I guess to, to your first point, um, it's very precious that we've been able to create this. Uh, and, you know – no one's with us forever, and I'm very yeah. glad that this was not posthumous. Yeah, that, that exactly. He, you know, he was well, and he came out to enjoy yeah. it. And Sensei Mike shared with me, Mike sat with him um, yeah. when it was showing, and he's just gone, I feel like I'm dreaming. You know, and, Exa- and That's exactly what he said when I got him on the couch. I said, how did Sensei go? And he said, he just said he was dreaming. And I was like, I'm done. Yeah. That, that, and, you can't and, get you know, better I, than that. I had a beer with Sensei afterwards, and I said, you know, look, I, I hope, you know, you, you're happy with that. And he's a man of few, few words, words and, yeah. and it's just very good, Thomas. son. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm sitting done. there having a beer Thanks. afterwards and I'm like, I'm, I'm really, really satisfied yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that he was able to, to see and experience it, you know. Yeah, that's very cool. We're going to have a very, very quick break, quick drinks break, and then we're going to get into a little bit about the, the historical stuff that you've watched, that you've put together, the journey that is, and, and talk a little bit about the time spent. Because like you said, COVID obviously was a bit of a protagonist that you wouldn't have normally had that time. Um, so stay with us, guys. This is a super interesting conversation we're having here with Sensei Tom about this amazing documentary of Sensei KO. Um, for all the information, do jump on the website, uh, www.shobakan.com.au and also check out their Facebook page as well. We'll have the session times, the one you want to get in will be the first one and that's on the 28th of november at the back lot back lot will also be advertising in as well too um but stick with us we'll be right back